Is that a beekeeper in my bed? Wait, that's me. Hot, don't you think? I wear a chin strap, eye covers, and a CPAP every night. I do this for my health, but also because it requires persistence and effort. I like doing stuff that most people would give up on. I also like strict routines in the morning because they give me the delusion that I am in control. I wasn't born an artist. I became one. When I was a kid in South Carolina, I didn't know that one could be an artist. I only did two things well. I could pick up AM radio in my teeth, and I could pay attention. Art is skill and imagination combined to manufacture something that transcends both. You can learn skill, but the rest is original equipment. Don't lose your instruction manual. The way into art usually has nothing to do with art. Get out of your creepy studio, go into the world, and pay attention to stuff that most people wouldn't notice. Cultivate interests other than art. Two of my favorite things, besides painting, are barbecue and magic. Skip the lecture on dystopian pancultural polemics and go to the one about beavers. Turn off your phone and take a walk. Leonardo da Vinci advised rousing the mind by looking at crumbled walls, glowing embers, and speckled stones. Listen to shrimp boat captains and bond traders. Read Stud Turkle's book, Working. One of the biggest determiners of success isn't education or IQ. It's paying attention to people who are successful. Choose whom you surround yourself with carefully. You can't be what you can't see. I'd rather have beers with a great sword swallower than a mediocre painter. In his novel, Anna Karenina, Leo Tolstoy refers to a labyrinth of linkages. The word art comes from the Latin artem, meaning to join or fit together. When I walk around the Upper West Side or in Central Park, I pay attention not to things, but the connections between things. It could be as simple as a shadow that passes across the ground and up the side of a mailbox. The secret to all of this is not having more, but wanting less. There's a story that the writers Joseph Heller and Kurt Vonnegut were at a lavish party on Shelter Island, hosted by a billionaire. As they looked around, Vonnegut said to Heller, How does it feel to know that our host probably made more money yesterday than your novel, Catch-22, did in its entire history. Heller responded, Yeah, but I've got something he can never have. What's that? Enough. My point is that all you need to be an artist is nothing, and most people don't have that. Don't try so hard. The moment that work becomes labor, you're screwed. Stacking three creamers in my local diner seems trite, but it holds great meaning because it manufactures a wholeness that was summoned only by my presence. And that's our daily work, manufacturing linkages whose only purpose is to be summoned by another human being. Beauty doesn't arise in the making, but in it having been made. There is no such thing as natural beauty. We declare something beautiful because John Keats taught us that truth and beauty are like the rotating beam of a lighthouse. They are eternally linked. These workmen thought I was a perv for filming them, but I was waiting for that confluence of linkages, that flash of lucidity when everything hums in unison. A painter's job is to collect these flashes like lightning bugs in a jar and try to keep them alive for as long as possible. Be conscious, but don't be conscious of your consciousness. If your goal is to make art with a capital A, then you risk becoming cynical because you're self-aware. There is nothing worse than cynicism in art. Say what you mean from your heart. Don't use paint in the service of an image, but as the embodiment of it. It always points back to the body. 
The first two lines of E.H. Gombrich's book, The Story of Art, are, There really is no such thing as art. There are only artists. He is referring, I think, to the Latin root of the word art, meaning skill. In other words, there is no bodiless skill. It's the singer, not the song. A painting should be inseparable from the painter, just as a knife cannot cut itself. To inspire literally means to inhale, which refers to the body, not the mind. Painting is intellectual, but thoughts begin with feelings, and feelings begin with emotions. Emotions are raw data sparked by a sensation in the body which directly triggers blood flow, body language, and facial expressions. I don't want to stand in front of an idea, but a thoughtfully constructed thing that exists separate from myself, which provokes inwardness and brings me aesthetic pleasure. That's how I possess myself in the world at that moment. Close your eyes and summon the moment when you knew you were a painter. Not when you aspired to paint, that word implies trying to win the approval of others, but when you knew. I was 10 years old, standing barefoot on the bank of a pond on the back nine of a golf course in Myrtle Beach. It was dusk, that hour between dog and wolf. I stared across the green gelatin of the water into the woods on the other side, where branches like ropes of black candy spread across sticky pools and sweet grass. I heard witches humming and lighting their ovens. I saw skeletons in tall hats, neither wax nor flesh, decaying as they flourished. The air smelled of pollen and plowed land. Then, without warning, my cane-lip-scented mouth uttered, The South is a genius. That's when I knew. Instead of applying oil paint in single dollops and then reloading your brush, try draining your brush completely. What I do is thin out my pigment with Gamsol or a medium. My medium of choice is one part walnut oil, one part galkid, which is an alkyd resin, and one part thinner. Then I press the loaded brush against the canvas and wiggle it until there is nothing left maintaining even pressure until the color dissipates like breath fogging a window and then disappearing. This is not only a technical tool, but a conceptual one. Exhausting the brush allows the viewer to witness the passage of time even though a painting is a static object. With a beginning, middle, and end, the entire lifespan of the mark plays out before your eyes. What differentiates a work of art from everything else in the world is that in art, there must be a transfer of energy from the artist to the viewer. When I first stand in front of a painting, I'm a meat puppet, helpless as if a foot is on my throat. Then the painting weakens. There's a transmission of energy. As I look, it looks. As I move, it moves. Beauty is twice beauty, that of the maker and the taker. The strongest paintings are those which escape the intentions of the artist and allow the viewer to grow more powerful. Exposing the birth, life, and death of one brushstroke is a sign of respect for your viewer because it lets them do half of the work, as if the painting is being manufactured as they look at it, allowing them to craft something and discover it at the same time. Last fall, I had a show in Cape Cod at the wonderful Katuit Center for the Arts. And on the drive home, Katie and I stopped at Norman Rockwell Studio in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Norman Rockwell has fascinated me for much of my adult life. I've never been the type of painter who separates the fine arts from illustration. Good design transcends all. As my teacher, William Halsey, used to say, Bry, good design makes you happy, and bad design goes everywhere. 
Unlike his contemporaries, Joan Mitchell and Jackson Pollock, whose content was driven by the painterly evidence of their own making, Rockwell's paintings were the product of preparation, observation, and the accretion of paint skins used in the service of an image rather than the embodiment of it. In other words, Mitchell painted light and Rockwell painted the thing being lit. Both are equally transformative. If you look closely at a Rockwell surface, you can feel his affection for delicious skins of oil color as an end in itself. That's the problem with the term realism. What's more real, what you see or how you feel? What's more authentic, accurately rendered water droplets on a chicken or a brushstroke that burns with intent and purpose? As Picasso said, some painters transform the sun into a yellow spot, others transform a yellow spot into the sun. Both are groovy. Picasso didn't say that, I did. Either way, Ultimately, paintings are found in the paint. The surfaces of Norman Rockwell are much richer and tactile than they appear in reproductions. Norman Rockwell, like Honoré Daumier, Raphael Sawyer, or Isabel Bishop, take us downtown to Chinatown, because they did both, rendering the truth and making you feel it simultaneously. On the surface, the difference is that a fine artist works for him or herself, and an illustrator works for someone else. But that's just art world snobbery. Norman Rockwell and I have the same job. We are image makers and image ridden. We go to our studios every day and make something where there was nothing. The frozen gravel crunched under my sneakers as I rounded the bend to Norman Rockwell's studio. My pride in our shared industry formed a lump in my throat. The words of Albert Pinkham Ryder came to mind. Allow me to share them with you. As I worked, I saw that it was good and clean and strong. I saw nature springing into life upon my dead canvas. It was better than nature, for it was vibrating with the thrill of a new creation. Exultantly, I painted until the sun sank below the horizon. Then I raced around the field like a colt let loose and literally bellowed for joy. When asked by a reporter how he practiced, drummer Buddy Rich replied, I usually take my hands out of my pockets. That's precisely why I draw trees, to take my hands out of my pockets. In other words, in this rapid, streamlined world, drawing allows me to see and think slowly because it is made slowly. My product is anti-speed. Slowness teaches me to be respectful of the invisible grace hidden everywhere. In the blade of grass poking between my toes, in the window pane, and in the jelly jar on the kitchen table. Or the old woman seated across from me on the subway, unaware that I'm drawing her. She has no idea she's teaching me about patience. Drawing is the skilled application of delay. But patience doesn't produce skill, it is itself a skill. That's why it's called practice. I live in the shadows of glass towers, but I draw live oak trees, mostly in and around Charleston, South Carolina. I sit on a portable stool under the canopy and copy what I see. But before pencil touches paper, I always recite my favorite haiku by Yosa Busan. Coolness, the sound of the bell as it leaves the bell. All of my paintings begin and end with the same image, a tree trunk and its shadow, that immovable point of contact, a trunk and a shadow moving away from it, the sound of the bell as it leaves the bell. A trunk and its shadow say, this is here. By paying attention and drawing them in detail with pencil on paper, I can respond, I am here. I love that physical thereness of a tree. That's why I pay careful attention to the trunk twisting into the earth. 
I place you, the viewer, close to the bottom of the tree so that the canopy is only apprehended in your peripheral vision. The physical form occupies the center of the image and is surrounded on both sides by streaks of light and shade indicating the distance. This is a conceptual decision, not a visual one. Catapulting your eye from extreme close-up to far away with no middle ground suggests standing before the raw power of nature with nothing in between. Content in my work is a direct function of how near or far away something appears from your face. I learned this from Pierre Bonnard's term, void in the middle, in which he emptied his interiors so that your peripheral vision gradually assembles relationships of color and forms at the edges of the composition, not in the center. Like a camera lens twisting in and out of focus, you find yourself in an almost sleepy state in which you're seeing stuff or have just seen stuff. I play with this dynamic of interior-exterior like turning a sock inside out. In my drawings, the middle comes forward and the sides go backwards. In my paintings, the middle goes back and the sides come forward. In other words, I'm trying to transmit the physical presence of a tree without the tree. I do this with high horizons and low sight lines to pull your gaze into the distance. But there can be no deep space without what I call shoulders. Dense thickets of oil paint in shallow space that hold the edges like soft compositional pushpins. As if curtains parted to reveal not a painting of a tree, but treeness. It's never about a tree. That's just the delivery system for something hidden in plain sight. I performed magic as a teenager because I liked fooling people and wearing pants that were like a cheap hotel. No ballroom. Little did I know, magic was teaching me how to look at painting. Everything you see is equally true if you unsee it. When you're painting an apple, you're also painting everything that's not an apple. Nothing is what it seems. There is always more. To quote John Keats once again, Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. In painting, what gets left out is as important as what stays. Each new brushstroke squeezes out an old one, so that a finished painting is only half visible. The other half is the hushed vibration of absence. Lodged inside every great work of art is its opposite. There is no light without dark, no form without space, no motion without stasis, no curves without angles, and no red without its absence. I get emails from folks all over the world, and I answer every single one of them. One kind gentleman wrote me the other day and said that he'd studied at the Art Center School in Los Angeles in the early 1960s with Lorser Feitelson, who, along with Carl Benjamin, Frederick Hammersley, and John McLaughlin, were known as the California Classicists. Their hard-edge abstractions embodied a shift in the late 1950s from the energetic heat of abstract expressionism to the coolness of pop art and minimalism. In a 2004 catalog essay, critic Dave Hickey wrote, The New York school painters would create their idiom by internalizing abstraction, psychologizing it in the manner of Freud and Jung. The California painters take the opposite route by radically externalizing the surrealism of experience in the West. Their presumption that surreality, visual anxiety, and splendor have their roots in the physical and social world rather than the autonomous self. That line, physical and social world, struck a chord in me. My work always emphasizes the physical, external properties of paint, but it should not do that at the expense of its social import. How does my work fit into society? I think we have to ask that of our paintings. For whom do we paint? When asked for whom she wrote, Gertrude Stein said, 
I write for myself and for others. I paint for myself and for others. If you only paint for yourself, then it's a kind of self-therapy. But as soon as you put your painting in public, it becomes part of society, and thus a political statement. It might help to examine the terms political and propaganda. A lot of what gets marketed as political art is really propaganda, which is defined as information used to promote a particular political cause or point of view. And that's not what I'm talking about. The creative act has one purpose, to obliterate the way we see the world and replace it with a new way, the very definition of politics. Whether you're seeing Hamilton on Broadway or looking at a watercolor of kittens in a basket, you are submitting to the entire political belief system of that artist. Just like a politician writes policy to take his or her constituency from one place to a better place, a painter uses foreground, middle ground, and background to take the viewer from one place to another place. Like politicians, artists are part of a constituency who aims to subvert, influence, and change the way that people see the world, always with the notion that art knows best. For example, Henri Matisse's 1911 painting, The Red Studio, is political, because Matisse violently rips himself away from the European tradition of linear perspective in favor of the flat picture plane, which is a formal and emotional force that holds the image together and destroys it simultaneously. The table, chair, and objects obey the rules of linear perspective, but the red resists. Painting should always embody resistance of some kind, be it two discordant colors, a line interrupted, a sudden shift in surface thickness, anything that breaks the spell for a moment to remind us that beauty is elusive and that the first three letters of the word artificial are art. It's like having a pebble in your shoe. You can still go places, but you're always aware of resistance. If you look closely, the drawn lines aren't painted on, but are simply the cracks of raw canvas between the skins of Indian red. Space is no longer what's between the objects, but is a solid, tactile fact. When you learn to see everything as colors and shapes, it's easier to paint colors and shapes. In other words, Matisse bends the laws of nature to fit the laws of art. We don't look into the painting, but at it. Matisse is saying, trust your sensitivity. He's saying, let's play. Behold what red reveals. Not red, but reverie. The best way to say F you to suffering and injustice is to make something beautiful and put it into the world. To make something beautiful is to acknowledge pain and the will to rise above it. Beauty is the ultimate form of protest. Art can only be political. One of the privileges of my painting life is speaking to audiences around the country, and even overseas. Sometimes I do visiting artist gigs where I'm brought in to critique the work of painting students, usually those in graduate school. And something I've noticed over the last 10 years, and friends of mine, other painters, will confirm this, is that there's a timidness now to not say anything too critical about a student's work for fear of being perceived as out of touch. It's become fashionable for painting students to say, if you don't like my work, it just means you don't understand my experience. Yeah, or maybe your painting just isn't very good. Yet, it takes a long time to do this. To believe that an artist's work is so closely tied to his or her identity that it should be immune from any criticism is to treat that artist with total contempt. That's how you treat a child. You say, everyone gets a trophy. That's aesthetic relativism. 
And that's the thing about art. You don't know what makes it good, but you sure as heck know when it's bad. Also, isn't the whole point of art to help us understand your experience? I live and work in New York City, but I identify as a Southern painter. I could easily say, oh, you had to be born there, but that would be wrong. My job is to bring the place to life precisely for people who weren't born there. Billie Holiday endured a lifetime of abuse and tragedy, but oh, that voice. It's all right there, pink and naked, in the execution, not in the press release. In other words, she removed the gap between what she had to express and the tools she used to express it. And I didn't know that until I listened to bootleg albums when I was a kid, which featured her making mistakes and starting over and cursing and starting over and doing it again and again and again, perfecting her craft. I used to think she just walked into the studio, knocked it out in one take, and it was perfection. But it wasn't until I learned that great artists spend a lifetime perfecting their skills that I had permission to be an artist. In order for a work of art to endure, it must possess two things, intent and execution. Intent without skill is a hot mess. Skill without intention is dry and academic. Both, in equilibrium, are molten lava. That's why it's important to study antiquity and works from the past. Because they endured. The reason they endured is because they mastered the one thing that you can't get from a press release or screenshot. Form. We make visual stuff. The more good stuff we look at, the more likely we will make some ourselves. There's a reason that this terracotta amphora from the 5th century BC still stops us in our tracks. Tenable form. Trust your sensitivity. If it looks good, it is good. Contemporary artists and art students aren't really taught much about skill because it's not glamorous. And the art world is obsessed with glamour. That's the Andy Warhol hoax. Andy Warhol said that art is whatever you can get away with. Would you want your pilot or your heart surgeon to do whatever they can get away with? Then why would you want your artist to? Fuck you, Andy. George Santayana wrote, beauty is the cooperation of pleasures, truth the cooperation of perceptions. Western ideals of beauty are rooted in principles promulgated by the ancient Greeks and Romans, such as proportion, harmony, line, scale, and the treatment of light and dark. Art history shows us over and over that the thoughtful arrangement of form and the calibration of color can stir cognition and transmit emotions impossible to verbalize. That's why it's visual art. You can't know beauty until you learn how to recognize it. You can't take someone else's breath away unless it's been done to you. Whenever you finish a painting, it is measured against every other painting that was ever created. As soon as you put your work into the world, it becomes part of the larger culture, and as such, is subject to those forces that might be out of your control, such as negative criticism or even appropriation. And here's where it gets really sticky. Theft requires policing, and the last thing we need are culture police. St. Francis of Assisi, in his canticle, said it best, brother sun, sister moon, we are all one. Isn't the whole purpose of art to help expose the threads that connect all of us, not to exclude those without the secret password. I know that all of this makes me sound like a fossil, and I am so okay with that. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. <laughs>